history of the Democrat Party. I can say that his book saved me and it changed my life. So without further ado, you guys, please welcome to the stage Dinesh D'Souza. Thank you. Wow. This is absolutely awesome. I'm thrilled to be here with Candace and um, be part of this important movement. I was, um, I was 17 years old when I first saw America. I remember uh, the airplane uh, descending on New York City. I, I looked out of the window. Uh, I saw the skyline. I saw the Statue of Liberty, uh, and a very strange feeling came over me. Uh, I realized my life was going to be completely different from that moment on. I felt I was moving from the margin of the world to the center, and I recognized in a very youthful way that I was coming to a country where I could be the architect of my own destiny. This is the, to me, the great promise of the American dream. Notice, by the way, that no other country really has a dream. I mean, the Chinese don't really have a dream. There's, there's no Indian dream. Uh, there may be a French dream, but I really don't want to know. <laughs> but when, when people talk about the American dream and they talk about immigrants, they, talk, they think in terms just of economic opportunity. Of, of American prosperity. A and that is, in fact, part of the story. Uh, I have an acquaintance in Mumbai, in Bombay, India, who's been trying to come to America for many years. Uh, he's never managed to get a visa. And finally, I said to the guy, I said, hey, um, why are you so eager to come to America? He goes, Dinesh, I really want to move to a country where the poor people are fat. <laughs> and <clears throat> And that is, like I say, that is part of the story. I lived with a host family in Arizona, and they would say to me, Dinesh, you're in a great state, Arizona. We want to take you sightseeing. We want to take you to see the Grand Canyon. We want to take you to see Tombstone, Arizona. You can see the fight at the OK Corral. And I was like, actually, if you want to take me sightseeing, take me to a grocery store. I want to see 17 types of cheese. 35 types of ice cream. But, but bigger than that, I think what America has meant to me has been the chance to write the script of my own life. And that dream we embrace by becoming Americans, by emba embracing the principles of America. The great obstacle to the American dream for immigrants, for minorities, for blacks, for Latinos, for Asian Americans, has simply been the Democratic Party. That's the historical truth. But it's a truth that is beautifully hidden from the American people, and particularly from minorities. The reason for this is that the left has been so powerful in academia, in the media, and in Hollywood. And by Hollywood, of course, I mean the whole entertainment industry, the music industry, the comedians, Broadway, and so when you control the megaphones of the culture, you control the narrative. The Democrats have been so successful in controlling the narrative that they're able to convince Republicans that the Republicans are the bad guys. There was a head of the RNC, Ken Melman, a, a few years ago, who was going to black churches and going to the NAACP and apologizing for the racist history of the Republican Party even though the Republican Party has no racist history. <clears throat> Not only was the Democratic Party the party of slavery, but it was also the party of segregation, of Jim Crow, of racial terrorism, of the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, in my last movie, Death of a Nation, there's a scene. 
There's a scene in the movie where, if you didn't know my work, would, would be totally baffling. Uh, you see a scene in 1935 where all the heads of the major departments of the Nazis, the Justice Department and so on, are meeting in a room. And in this room they are uh, enacting the Nuremberg Laws, which were the infamous laws making Jews into second-class citizens. And the Nazis are very proud of themselves. They believe they are creating, in their own words, the world's first racist state, which to them is an accomplishment. They have a stenographer present to record the proceedings. And as the meeting begins, one of the Nazis puts his hand up and basically says to, the, to, his, to the, his fellow Nazis, we cannot create the world's first racist state because the Democratic Party has already done this in the United States. And the Nazis look at each other and they're embarrassed, and quite frankly, they're a little pissed. They're a little pissed at being beaten to the punch. And so they, they ask this guy, well, what do you mean? And he says, well, what are we trying to do to the Jews? First, we're trying to segregate the Jews into ghettos. The Democrats have already passed segregation laws throughout the American South. Second, we want to outlaw miscegenation into marriage between Jews and other Germans. The Democrats have already passed anti-miscegenation laws in 19 states. And third, we want to confiscate the property of Jews, state-sponsored discrimination. He goes, that is also the legacy of the Democratic Party in America. And so the Nazis adjourn the meeting, and they demand copies of these Democratic laws. And when they get them and they reassemble, basically what they do is they take the Democratic laws, cross out the word black, write in the word Jew, and that is what we know today as the Nuremberg Laws. In other words, the Nuremberg Laws weren't just parallel to the racist laws of the Democratic Party. They were actually lifted directly from those laws. Now, interestingly, when I keep using the phrase the Democratic Laws, it seems a little odd. But the Nazis actually know something that is not taught in any high school or college in the United States, namely that every single segregation law in the American South from the 1880s to the 1950s was passed by a Democratic legislature, was signed by a Democratic governor, was enacted by Democratic officials, and there is no exception to this rule. Moreover, the fact that the Nazis got their racist legislation from the United States and specifically from the Democratic Party this fact, to my knowledge, appears in no textbook, in no article. It's never been on the History Channel. It's never been on NPR. It's not in Wikipedia. It is simply a fact erased from history, even though it's indisputable. The meeting occurred. I have the transcripts. It's supported by scholarship. It happened, but it's been essentially whited out. Whited out. Now, left knows that this is their history. And so in order to get out of it, their only way to get out of it, and this is what they put all their cards on today, is the idea of the big switch, which is the idea that the two parties switch sides, exchange platforms. Now, frankly, on the face of it, this is a little implausible. I mean, it's kind of like if somebody wanted to tell you, hey guys, you know, in the 1970s, the cops all decided to become criminals, and the criminals all decided to become cops. They, they just decided to switch sides. You'd be like, wow, how would that happen? That sounds insane. Um, but nevertheless, this, is, this idea of the big switch is argued with complete conviction and sincerity, and it is taught in our schools and so the case really hangs on this. And it also hangs on the idea that, say, for example, the Republican Party today has nothing to do with the legacy of Abraham Lincoln. That Lincoln, if he had lived today, would be a left-winger and a progressive. So I want to start by testing that idea. Very interestingly, when Lincoln defined slavery, Lincoln defined it not in racial terms. Lincoln said that the essence of slavery is captured in a simple idea. You work. I eat. In other words, the essence of slavery is theft. One guy does all the work, and the other guy steals the fruit of his labor. 
And Lincoln said that this is actually what the Democratic Party stands for, both in the North and in the South. The idea of theft. And then Lincoln was asked, what about the Republican Party? What does the Republican Party stand for? And Lincoln put it in his very homespun way. He goes, the hand that makes the corn has the right to put the corn into its own mouth. In other words, we have the right to, cre to keep the fruits of our labor. And this is now, this is Lincoln's position in the middle of the 19th century. And yet I would say today, if you fast forward more than 150 years, and you ask, what is the credo of the Republican Party? What, is, what does Trump stand for today? I would argue that Trump basically stands for the fact that the hand that makes the corn has the right to put the corn in its own mouth. No change. And, and the Democratic Party has evolved in various ways. I would say the Democratic plantation today very different than it was in the 1830s and 40s. But nevertheless, if you were to sum up the core principle of the Democratic Party, is it not accurate to say that it's still today summed up by that simple Lincolnian description, you work and I eat. One guy works and makes stuff, and another guy, or through the agency of the government, confiscates that stuff and disposes of it as they see fit. They still stand for the same thing, only in a different form. Now, what about this notion of the big switch? I'm going to zoom into this for just a moment because it's actually very important. What really happened in, in America is that racism began to decline dramatically after World War II. The reason for this is kind of obvious. Hitler had built his whole ideology on racial supremacy. And so when American troops went into the gas chambers, they went into the concentration camps, they pulled out those starving, emaciated figures, Basically, racial supremacy took a mortal blow. And this fact, which started in the 40s and continued through the 50s, began to have a huge impact in America. And so, for example, Lyndon Johnson. Lyndon Johnson realized early on that the Democratic Party in the South had been built on the glue of white supremacy. That's what held the Democratic Party together. And if white racism was declining in the South, what was the future of the Democratic Party? There needed to be a new approach. <clears throat> Barry Goldwater, in 1964, opposed the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Now, interestingly enough, Goldwater was not a racist. In fact, he was the co-founder of the Arizona NAACP. He had been involved in the desegregation of the Phoenix schools. But Barry Goldwater was a libertarian, small government, limited government. And when the Civil Rights Act of 1964 proposed the outlawing of discrimination, not just by the government, but also in the private sector, Goldwater opposed that on libertarian grounds. So he voted against the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And as a result, he won a handful of deep South states. But he lost the rest of the country. He won his home state of Arizona. And that was just about it. Lyndon Johnson swept the 64 election. So when Richard Nixon came along in 68, Richard Nixon learned from Goldwater's experience. Richard Nixon said, no, I'm not going to campaign for the votes of the Deep South. I'm actually going to campaign for the Sun Belt. And the Sun Belt was the, the face of the changing South. The South was becoming less agricultural, more industrial. Northerners were moving south. There was tremendous growth in southern cities stretching all the way from St. Petersburg in Florida through Tampa, Raleigh, uh, Dallas, Houston, all the way to Nixon's home state of California. That was the Sun Belt. So Nixon said, I'm going to go after the non-racist vote of the urban south. And I'll do it by appealing to free markets, anti-communism, patriotism, family values, essentially the early phase of the Reagan agenda that emerged later in the 1980s. And Nixon won not the Deep South, which went to George Wallace, the Democratic segregationist. Nixon won the so-called upper or peripheral South. I tell you all this because all this history is now distorted. From the point of view of the left, Nixon was a tricky, tricky dick. Uh, he, he made a sort of subtle appeal to uh, deep south racists to come over to the Republican Party. 
So when people say this to me, I say to them, I challenge you to cite a single racist campaign statement made in public by Richard Nixon. Let's hear it. If Nixon is campaigning to the Deep South racist, surely he said racist things. Where are they? Nowhere. No one's ever been able, able to give an example. And so what they say is that, no, Nixon didn't say any racist things, but he used racist dog whistles. And the idea of the racist dog whistle, let's think about it for a minute. The idea of a dog whistle is that Nixon was making dog noises that nobody in the country could hear. They were at such a high pitch that the whole media, the whole country couldn't even hear them. But the racists who are the dogs have the heightened antenna that they alone could translate these messages and, and pick them up. I mean, this is the nonsense that is now masquerading for actual scholarship in the United States. The real proof of the pudding is simply to ask this question. If Nixon converted the racist Dixiecrats to be Republicans, how many of them did he convert? And so in my last movie, Death of a Nation, I say, all right, let's make a list of the Dixiecrats. Who are the Dixiecrats? They're the people who A, joined the Dixiecrat party, or B, voted against the Civil Rights Act of 64, or the Voting Rights Act of 65, or the Fair Housing Bill of 68. That is the definition of a Dixiecrat. And by that definition, there are about 150 Dixiecrats congressmen, senators, governors, and so on the screen in the movie, boom, there they are. There, there are their names, there are all their photos. And now you ask, how many of those dudes became Republicans? And the correct answer is two. One in the House, Albert Watson, one in the Senate, Strom Thurmond, and every other racist Dixiecrat lived and stayed and died in the Democratic Party, have been lionized by Democrats. Their buildings in Washington, D.C. now uh, named after them. And this is the empirical fact. The, the beauty of living today is when I talk about this stuff on campus, students look at me like I'm from Mars, and I say, look, whip out your phone. Type in racist Dixiecrat. Look at all the names. And now count to see how many of these guys switched. So we can today verify this information, which makes us very powerful. We can show that what we're saying is true, and we can show that what they're saying is false. <clears throat> There's a professor at Princeton named Kevin Cruz, who has actually assembled a sort of informal list of 150 left-wing historians to refute me on these points. And their strategy is, I would call it, to emit a squid-like cloud of rhetoric to obfuscate the issue. They're masters of obfuscation. And so they'll say things like, well, what about Jesse Helms? What about John Tower? My point is, Jesse Helms and John Tower are not Dixiecrats. We're not asking whether any Democrats became Republicans. We're asking whether the specific faction of racist Dixiecrats became Republicans. Let's agree on our terms before we have an argument. Whenever I talk about slavery on campus, some professor of Romance languages will jump up and go, Dinesh, you're pointing the finger at the Democratic Party, but that's a lie. You know and I know that slavery is an American sin, Americans did it, and there's plenty of blame to go around. Now, first of all, I make the obvious point that America doesn't do things. Some Americans do them, and other Americans try to stop them. Right? And then the way to crush the debate and to win it completely is what I call the incendiary fact. And so here's my incendiary fact. In 1860, which is the year before the Civil War, no Republican owned a slave. Now notice I'm not saying that no Republican leader owned a slave. I'm saying that no Republican in the United States owned a slave. And if that's true, if that's true, it means that all the slaves in the country, there were four million at the time, this was the zenith of American slavery, four million slaves were all owned by Democrats. Now the, this is the kind of statement that kind of reminds me, if you will, of an atheist who was reading through the Bible. He read it from the beginning to the end, and at the end he made a small note in the margin. He wrote, important if true. <laughs> important if true. That's, that's applicable to my statement, important if true. But the beauty of my statement is it's, in a scientific sense, refutable. 
All you have to do is give me the name of one solitary Republican who owned a slave, and I would have to take it back. And yet to this day, two and a half years after I made this assertion for the first time, and despite innumerable and tireless effort, media matters, you can only imagine all these people doing their very best to ferret out a single counterexample, have not been able to do it. About six months ago, a fellow at the University of Michigan wrote me, and he goes, Dinesh, I gotcha, I gotcha. Ulysses S. Grant inherited a slave, a single slave, but nevertheless a slave, on his wife's side. And I said, man, that is what I called an almost touche. You almost had me, but I got to point out to you that at the time this happened, Ulysses S. Grant was a Democrat. <laughs> he became a Republican later. Now, why is all this important? It's important because fake news sits on top of fake history. Fake narratives about America, attempts to con us and intimidate us and put us up against the wall. Part of our liberation is not just the ability to read between the lines, to figure out when you're being conned, but also to be able to deconstruct these fake narratives. And so as you arm yourself and equip yourself with knowledge, you become what I call a very dangerous American. You'll notice that the other side is a little bit, whenever you start speaking, it, they get extremely nervous and agitated because they know that everything they're going to say, you already know. But what you're going to say, they have no idea. And they have no comeback. So they're completely disarmed. It's actually, um, it's actually a kind of an exciting notion because it, it, it makes you a powerful figure in the American debate. It, it arms you with, the, with truth and with knowledge and you're the one who actually knows what you're talking about. Uh, Martin Luther King has a beautiful line which has always inspired me. It's actually not the line about the content of our character. He says, ultimately, every man must write with his own hand the charter of his Emancipation Proclamation. And I think what he means by this is that in a society of equal rights under the law, we have the right to be treated equally by the government. We have that right. But we don't have any more rights than this. And, the, and what we do with our freedom and what we make of our liberty and what we make of our lives, this ultimately is up to us. I was, uh, as part of my penance with the Obama administration, um, I was sentenced to teach um, immigrants, mainly Latino, about uh, the English language. And one time, one of my students asked me an interesting question. She said, um, you know, you're all involved in American politics and we don't understand any of it. What really is the main difference between the two parties? How would you summarize it? What's the core of it? And I realized, I felt a little helpless for a moment because I realized that my normal way of talking, appealing, say, to the American founding or the Constitution, all of that was remote from these people. These are people whose big challenges were things like, how do I buy a ticket to go get on the bus to go to get to Target where I can work? Uh, so these are people who are operating at the most basic level, and they want me to explain American politics at that level. And so I want to leave you with my thought about how I think American politics can be divided at the simplest level. I think essentially there are two models for people who start at the bottom to move to the top or to improve their life. The first is the model of the ladder, and the second is the model of the rope. So the ladder is the ladder of opportunity, and that's what the Republican Party stands for, ladders of opportunity. Now, the government does have a role to hold the ladder, which means to protect our rights. Some of us are going to get higher or lower on the ladder depending on how we climb, and also depending on factors we don't control, like luck. But nevertheless, the ladder represents, for the most part, earned achievement. And when you get up on the ladder, you can say, this is my life, I made it, I did it. The other approach, which is the democratic approach, is the rope. And you can think of the rope as a bunch of guys, these are the Democrats, they're on the top of a building, and we lowly minorities and immigrants are all down there, and they let down the rope. And they go, okay guys, hang on to the rope, we're gonna pull you up. That's their model. Now, on the first glance, 
the ladder is less appealing than the rope. Why? Because the ladder you actually have to climb. The rope you're just supposed to hold on. It seems easier. But if you think about it, it soon dawns on you that you're very dependent on the guys who hold the rope on the other end. If they let go, down you go. And so a second point is if you stick around a little while and kind of watch the rope in action, you begin to realize that a lot of people who take the rope never seem to get to the top. You notice they get to the middle or they get off the ground and then the people on top of the building seem to hold. They don't pull, they hold. And then it occurs to you that maybe those people don't want any of these guys to get to the top. Why? Because they've got you where they want you. You're in a position of suspended dependency. You're too far from the ground to drop and you're not far enough from the top to be able to climb on your own. You just hang there. And so I think that for all of us, ultimately we're faced with this simple choice. Do we want an America of the ladder or do we want an America of the rope? In the America of the rope, you have this guardian class that seems to get all the benefits that needs us because they offer us crumbs in exchange for the thing that they want most from us. Not today. We're not in the days of slavery. They don't want to steal our labor. In fact, they want something from, from us that they think is free for us to give, our vote. And so they need us to vote for them to keep the whole rope mechanism going. But it seems to me that our liberation is to recognize that that's actually not the way. We don't want our destiny to be dependent on them. We want our destiny to be, de to be dependent on us. The way forward is the way of the ladder. That is our future. That's how we begin to achieve the same dream that so many earlier generations have enjoyed. That's how we move America for all Americans closer to what Reagan meant when he spoke so beautifully now a few decades ago of what he called morning in America. Thank you very much. Thank you.